My name is Robert Winslow, and I'm a Go enthusiast. I'm a consulting developer. I try to help startups with their scaling and launching problems. And along the way, I pick up a fair bit of Go. Uh, I'm also getting over a cold, so if I stop and cough, forgive me. And if I get quiet, say something. If I'm too loud, I'd say something. And finally, I love questions. So please feel free to ask them anytime. What we're going to talk about today uh, are the basics of serialization and why you should be excited about serialization. Why you might need another serialization format. What makes flat buffers special. And some examples on how to use it. So a serialization format can take many forms. It's pretty general. Examples are JSON protocol buffers, thrift, XML, and a lot, a lot of other ones. Question, who here spends time working with serialized data? Raise your hands. Oh, trick question, everybody does. <laughs> serialization is a way of specifying what data means. Without that, you just have sequences and bytes. So we all work with serialization formats all the time. But there are already a lot of them. Why would we need a new one? Turns out that at Google, Android game developers need a better way to store their data. Games are actually demanding applications. Even though we have angry birds, things like that, we also have uh, all sorts of very heavy 3D, uh, you know, first person shooter type games. And it turns out that moving data around can be uh, especially on phones, any time that you uh, allocate an object say on Android uh, on the JVM, it creates a little bit of friction. Existing uh, formats like protocol buffers create a lot of objects, and we'll get to that in a minute. So the primary alternative for these Android developers was to use protocol buffers, which is reasonable. Who here has used protocol buffers? Great, yeah. So, uh, hugely popular, and they've been around a while. And there are a lot of good things about them. They're robust, they're secure, they've been audited completely. Very popular, and just like the point of IBM, nobody ever got fired for picking protocol efforts. However, they have a number of shortcomings. They allocate many objects in the process of parsing data. They don't let you randomly access your data. So even if you have an array-like structure in the macro, you don't get to index into that in constant time. As a consequence, they have poor data locality. So the question was, can we talk about data locality a little bit? So it turns out that the way CPUs in memory are related these days, so the CPUs are much, much faster uh, than the memory. And so the crucial bottleneck is how do you feed this monstrous processing engine with enough data to keep it busy? The best way to do that is to keep data in line, uh, effectively in an array. So anytime you violate that, anytime you require access to another part of RAM, you have to load it into the cache on the CPU, and uh, it causes stalls. And so avoiding that is key to memory performance. So the kind of the moral there is if you can lay it out like an array, it'll be good. And what happens is you sort of stream across the array, and you always keep the CPU full of data for that. <clears throat> Very large code base. Protocol buffers weighs in on almost four megabytes of code. And they're slow, relatively speaking. And finally, I've heard rumors, uh, you know, I can't really substantiate this, but Google spends, Google spends millions of dollars. Is this dying? Not a popular topic. So I've heard rumors that Google spends millions of dollars every year serializing and deserializing protocol buffers. And you might say, oh, well, that's just because they have so many computers. Well, yeah, sure. But the order of magnitude is much higher than it maybe in theory should be. Um, quick, yep. You say um, 3.8 megabytes of code 
for the protocol buffer script base, is that the code for like the compiler for it, or the, code, the size of the code that it actually injects into your program at <coughs> the time? Uh, that is for the existing code for the protocol Okay. Not the generated code. So there's this interesting little group inside of Android, which itself is inside Google, called the Fun Propulsion Lab. And they get to make tools for game developers. And I think the point of them is to facilitate game development so that the ecosystem on Android gets better. And they went out on them and decided to try a new approach. Would it be possible to build a serialization format that's simple? You still get schema version for your data. You can access it randomly, like an array, and it's really, really fast. Yeah, you can. They tried it and they did it, and it's called flat buffers. So here are some micro benchmarks from the flat buffers website, and uh, I'll, go, I'll just go through them line by line because I think they're, they're very exciting. So uh, you can see uh, on the second line of this, it says protocol buffers. We do about 3,300 operations a second in this micro benchmark. And it takes 302 microseconds to do each operation. Flat buffers, in contrast, takes 80 nanoseconds. You could do over a thousand times more reads per second with flat buffers than protocol buffers. Any questions? I'm not done. All right, so we're going to talk about how they do that. So it's a new standard. It's an open source project from Google that came out last year. And it's created and maintained by Wilder Van Orderson, who's sitting right up here. And you should talk to him whenever you want after the talk. And it's a, got a great open source license. So the big idea behind flat buffers is that they are just statically typed schema version, portable structs. They're a way to lay out data in memory on a file and interpret it in a very lightweight manner. So I can, I can never lose by quoting Rob Pike. He says, rule five, data dominates. If you've chosen the right data structures and organize things well, the algorithms will almost always be self-edited. Data structures, not algorithms, are central to programming. Have any of you seen this notion before? So let's talk about speed and how we get it. <clears throat> One thing is, you know, why, why bother trying to make things faster? Computers are really fast, who cares? Well, it turns out orders of magnitude are still really important. If you can figure out a way to use one-tenth the number of computers to do a task that would be in, in your cluster, yeah, that's worth doing. You do that a couple times, all of a sudden you can do one more thing simply that you couldn't do before. Flat buffers has a different philosophy, and uh, it's designed for the bottom up to be really fast. The way it does this is that on read, there are no memory allocations, there are no intermediate objects. Uh, we talked about data locality earlier. Uh, it's, data is tightly packed, uh, so it's very friendly to CPU data caches. And speaking of caches, uh, there's minimal code on hot execution paths for reading data. So instruction caches on CPUs also can get polluted with too much code. So the primary way flat buffers works is just by doing arithmetic on the pointers, which you know, most of us are very familiar with, but not in the serialization context. When you're reading data in flat buffers, you have no calls to malloc. You let that sink in a little bit. It's a very powerful idea. In general, you can write software without calling malloc. You're on a good path. So motivating example number one, how would you serialize an array? This is going to be pretty simple, but I think it's interesting. So an array is just a sequence of fixed width elements. You can use pointer arithmetic to find what you want. So let's say we have an array of the first four prime numbers. They're each 32 bytes, or sorry, 32 bits wide. Uh, they look like what's on the bottom here. First one is one second. Or sorry, two, three, five, seven. So you index into that 
by saying, oh, here's four bytes, four bytes, four bytes, four bytes. You do the multiplication, you land where you need to be, you interpret the next four bytes as your number, and you're done. And in code, you have a buffer that holds those bytes. You can write a function like this get function here, but assuming the data is a little endian. You give it the offset you want and then the byte buffer. You calculate, I'm sorry, you give it the index and the byte buffer. You calculate the offset you need, which is the width of the data type times the index. And then you can dive down into unsafe land and cast it into the value you want. And it works so you get 0, 1, 2, 3 to the data. More interesting is a struct. So a struct is just a heterogeneous group of fixed width elements. And again, you can just use pointer with the type defined by one. Any questions so far? Great. So let's say you had a struct called particle as a position in a three-dimensional space and a color. Nine bytes long. You can encode it in a byte buffer. The first two bytes, 1, 0, is x. The second two bytes, 2, 0, is y. 3, 0, z. And then 128, 0, 1, 92 is the RGB. To get x, similarly to the previous example, you jump into the buffer. You pick the two bytes you want. It was an int 16. You cast it to the type you want, and you're done. Similarly for y, just plus 2. And then Z plus two again. Are we familiar with using unsafe pointers? Yeah. Okay. It's okay for now. And finally, uh, so the RGB value is three bytes, and so the type is actually a three byte array, which is distinct, of course. Great. Okay. So just like these things, which are in memory and are platform dependent. And have Indian Indianness that varies across platforms. Flat buffers takes that and standardizes it, but the idea is the same. Just use this pointer. Okay, let's get to the code. So here's a schema, and imagine we had a game, good player, very simple. I'd like to slow down here and make sure everybody understands what this is specifying. So you, you can construct a hierarchy of object types, primarily called tables or structs. You can give them names, you can nest them, a variable like the ways of structs and tables. But in the end, you specify a base type. Here it's a player. In more advanced schemas, you can players, for example, can have uh, inventories, you can have things that are worlds, you can store all sorts of data, really anything you can So to use this, well first you've got to compile the flat buffers compiler, which is a simple uh, make. And then you can use it uh, to create Go code. You run flat C dash G, which specifies Go code, and then the name of the schema. It creates one little file. And this is interesting because the code to generate the Go code that you'll use is written in C++. And so far we have uh, generation code for C++, Go, Java, and C Sharp. And it's a tiny little file. Uh, the generated code in this instance is just over a kilobyte in size. And then we can use it. There's still a tiny bit of implementation detail in here, which I think we could do some API refactoring to remove. But you start off by creating what's called a flat buffers builder, which is uh, a management object for creating a sequence of bytes that is interpreted as a flat buffer. It's an implementation detail, but in fact, uh, variable length vectors, like strings, need to be created outside of their objects. So first we create a string, which is my name, Robert, uh, and that's going to be six bytes long plus a uh, terminating zero, so seven total. The next line, we start, we take our generated code, which is imported under the name game, and we, we start a player on the builder. 
and then we add the name that we created earlier, and then we add help, and then we tell the builder that we're done, and then finally we close the builder. And what the builder has now is a set of bytes, and we can take those bytes and write them to a file, and that's all we have to do. So the last two lines fetch those bytes, and then the final line writes it to a flare, uh, file called robert.player. And the size of that file is pretty small, it's only 40 bytes, which is nice because you know, if you think about it, we're not storing that much information, so it should be commensurate with how much we're storing. And it is. And then we can load it back up, and we can read it using our nice I or util function. And then we use the single game get rid of player function, which was generated for us. And then we can query it and return values. And health is something that we set, and uh, name is something that we set. Any questions? Yeah. So, this is interesting. When they're going to use Roku, they'll have the embedded software for embedded device to the memory constraint, basically, for instance. Would you agree? So, it's, but the problem is you have to sort of see code, it's very mm -hmm. very small, you have to get everything packed in really closely, mm -hmm. write the code yourself. So, would it be, at a high level, would it be fair to say that you're doing that, this, this framework allows you to use it? Is the error prone is like generating the code for mm -hmm. so, so conceptually it's, it's not that different than using the layer so, so the question if I have it right was that uh, typically if you're doing low-level coding, you end up packing bytes a lot like this manually. Is it fair to say that flat buffers is a way to automatically create those byte packing routines? I absolutely think that's the case. And that it sort of lifts that into a library and makes it affordable and uh, you know, easy for anyone to use, in my opinion. So yeah, you, that's exactly what it is. So I just want to show a little bit what's in those 40 bytes. So uh, this will be a different talk, but the flat buffers format includes things called uh, V tables, which allow you to have deprecated fields, default values. At the beginning of this, we have eight bytes that are dedicated to telling us where the player object exists in the file. The next few bytes are metadata about our player object. The next few bytes are where is the Robert string. The next few bytes are health, then armor, and then the string. And we're done with just 40 bytes. So I think this is a good example of the kind of byte packing that you're talking about. Yeah, because I don't underestimate what you're doing because a lot of folks come from widely manually themselves. Mm -hmm. I want, I want to echo uh, what you're saying. So he's saying that this seems almost, you know, what's the big deal here? Uh, the big deal is that it reduces, by many orders of magnitude and complexity, to serialize data and read it very fast. Uh, it's lightweight. It's about as simple as you could get for the feature set that it has. Um, so it's very exciting. But like I said, I love serialization. Um, so could you comment on the fact that so the order of the fields in this in the code you wrote was main help armor, but the order that they're in there is help armor main. Could you comment on why that is? Could you repeat the question? Ba basically, why does main come at the end? I, be I believe it's because it's oh, a very yeah, sure. thing. But so the question is why why isn't main in line in the object? It's at the end. Well, the reason is because main can be as a variable length uh, set of bytes. So if you know the size of your primary type, which is the player, you can't also then have a variable sized uh, set of bytes in it. You, in fact, have to reference it when it lives elsewhere. And so that's why the name lives at the end. It's because it's actually outside of the object in the byte format. Any other questions? Yeah. You, you mentioned a lot about random access to this data. Mm -hmm. it's more, is the intended use case for me or something or uh, is there also a use for uh, more network bound applications? Whereas protocol buffers might be the solution for that. Thing. So the question is is this more for sort of file based data or does it also apply to network based data? That's a really good question. Uh, the use cases that I've seen where it came from, I understand it to primarily be about file based data. But the thing is, I mean, files and streams are the same thing. So 
if you could figure out a way to ship this to other devices, other processes, it's the same thing. So if you had a, uh, uh, an array or a list of these objects, you would just have all of the all the names basically at the end of that list. Or so it's kind of interesting. So the name string metadata there uh, is just an <coughs> offset that tells you where to locate the actual string. Right. So when it's being read, the generated code just calculates that. So you could put it anywhere you want. Right, but in order to quickly like iterate through this list, would you you would basically just have offsets for the objects? So, so the question was, you know, what kind of I think localities or what kind of locality can you get if you put all the strings in this example at the end of your name of these? Because you always be hopping back and forth to where you are and then where the strings are. Is that sort of what you're saying? Sort of, yeah. I mean, where's the efficiency? Is or do you use like? that you just grab like the longest string and that's how wide your string is for all of them. Uh, did you actually go back to the generator code? One more. <coughs> oh, this, this, yeah. So you can see how we create the string in one function file. The order in which we do these function calls determines the order in which they end up in the final uh, flat buffer. So if you put all of your strings at the end, it would look like a bunch of create string calls at the end of this because it builds from the back to the front. But if you wanted them to be interleaved, you would just do name, then the player object, then name, then the player object. Does that answer your question? There's freedom in how you lay it out. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Do you know anything about how flat buffers compared to the GOT format that's in the Ghost Ring library? I can't really speak to that. I will say one thing, which is that um, an issue was raised on the flat buffers uh, GitHub uh, that asked, can we make this fit into the interface for, uh, for the encoding package in Go? And uh, my response, you know, I'd love to hear a better way to do it. My understanding at the time was that because you have a schema and it's not in line in the data, you need a separate way to inform the consumer of that. Those are great questions. This is exactly what I hope would happen. <laughs> Go. So, the philosophy is simple. Flat buffers generates code that uses just a few jumps to get to anything that you would want. We use pointer arithmetic to skip what's a traditional parsing step entirely. Speed, part two. So it's not just mobile devices and it's not just games. 
every computer is resource constrained. At scale, inefficiencies add up to tremendous amounts of energy, time, and money wasted. Again, if you have hundreds, thousands of machines and you can shave off tens of percents of time, uh, that's a big deal. So flat buffers can help in that. And again, with the benchmarks that we're also happy about. And now that you've learned a little bit more about this, are there any questions about benchmarks? Which are hyper benchmarks? So there are more reasons. It's fast and it also supports schema version, union fields, default values, which we spoke about earlier, inline structs, variable length -like vectors, also spoke about those before. Uh, it is very robust uh, in its C implementation, and C sharp, Java, and Go are less mature and rising quickly. We're looking for more languages to support, uh, and as you'll see in the slide or two, the runtime is very small. So if anybody has another language they would like to add, uh, now's the time to do it. So over 2,200 GitHub stars, uh, the code is just small. Like I said, it's minimal for what it does, and it is. I think it's very, very nicely written. Um, the wire format is stable. It's been confirmed to be identical in uh, four different languages. A lot of tests, fuzz tests, which are one of my favorite things. And I want to emphasize again how few lines of code there are. So C C plus plus that generates C plus plus that generates the <laughs> all the uh, code for different languages, as well as the C plus plus implementation itself, is under five thousand lines of code. And then the Go runtime, which you have to import from every construct flat buffers. Uh, it's less than a thousand lines of code. So the ideas have been distilled to a very small number. So if you wanted to say audit flat buffers for a Go use case, you would look at the C code and its header files and the Go runtime, and you would be looking at five thousand lines of code, that's it. So go use it. There's tons of documentation, there's a white paper, there are benchmarks. Um, a lot of motivation for why the project exists. Uh, the source code is open. You can go install a runtime library right now on your laptop, and you can go check out the, uh, the schema compiler at the Flat Buffers Git repository. <coughs> so, thanks. Oh, questions. I should ask all those questions first. Yeah, thank you. So, the question was. Given that these are biased micro benchmarks, could we have structured the protocol buffer, for example, to uh, have been much more performant? Yeah, I think the answer, the answer to that is always yes. <laughs> I don't mean to kind of skip the question, but the answer is always yes. So, what is flat buffers less efficient than Like, my guess from your example. So the question is, what, what is flat buffers less efficient at than its peers? Uh, I'm not prepared to answer that question. I think it's a great one. And uh, if you want to write documentation that goes into that, I think we'll find that really valuable. Yeah. So I've seen the benchmarks, right? And uh, I'm aware, of, I think there are two more libraries that have this similar feature that they don't do any uh, allocations for reading. Uh, I think it's go go Prado and Scappy Prado. So can you compare uh, flat buffers to this? How do they differ? So the, the statement was uh, there are other libraries that are thematically similar to flat buffers. One of which is Captain Proto. And what was the other one? I think it's go go Prado, if I'm not mistaken. So go go the, Prado. The Google Go Protobuf library is Go Protobuf, and. Uh, the optimized version of that is GoGo protocol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to finish that, there are other libraries. Go protobuf is from Google, and GoGo protobuf is a faster version of that. Um, so they're actually there are doc documentation on the lab for site that addresses those things. Um, the most direct comparison is with Cap and Proto. Uh, 
It was found that the uh, scheme of versioning capabilities, excuse me, the scheme of versioning capabilities of CAP and Proto were not enough to meet the needs of the Android developers who got this started. And also the code uh, was not Visual Studio compatible, and so they had major compatibility issues. Do you know anything about the performance characteristics out of the compare? The question was, do I know anything about the performance characteristics versus uh, these other uh, protocols? Um, I don't have the numbers. Okay. Yeah. There was another question back there? Yeah. Um, how's the support for RPC and specifically the Go RPC library uh, by default uses God and God is instead of creating? So the question was, what's the support like for RPC, which are remote procedure calls? And specifically, how does it relate to the Go RPC library? Uh, my, I think the way I would answer that is that this is how you transmit data and you understand that and interpret it. It's at a lower level. What you choose to do with that data to interpret it as a function call or something else uh, is at a higher level. Yep. Yeah, I, I guess I was just curious um, if it's already in the library. Yeah, so, so the question was, is this integrated with kind of the standard Go interfaces for network communication? The answer is no. That's fourth time. We're still figuring out how to do that in the best way possible. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. I love all the great questions.